जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी जय गोपी जन वल्लभ गिरिवर धारी जय गोपी जन वल्लभ गिरिवर धारी यशोदानंदन ब्रज जन रंजन यशोदानंदन ब्रज जन रंजन यमुना तीर वन चारी यमुना तीर वन चारी जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी जय ओम विष्णुपाद परम हंस परिव्राज का चार्य स्त्रोत्र सत हिस्स डिवाइन ग्रेस अभय चरणारविंद भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी शील प्रभुपाद की जय अनंत कोटि वैष्णव वृंद की जय श्री श्री राधा माधव की जय श्री श्री गौर निताय की जय निताय गौर प्रेमानंदे ऑल ग्लोरीज टू दी असेंबल डिवोटीज ऑल ग्लोरीज टू दी असेंबल डिवोटीज ऑल ग्लोरीज टू दी असेंबल डिवोटीज ऑल ग्लोरीज ऑल ग्लोरीज ऑल ग्लोरीज टू श्री गुरु एंड गौरंग ओम ज्ञान तिमीरांध से ज्ञानांजन शलाकय चक्षुरोन्मील येन तस्म श्रीगुरव नम श्रीचैतन्य मनोभीष्ट स्थापित येन भूतले स्वयं रूप कदा मह्यम ददा स्वदाक वंदेहम श्रीगुर श्रीयुतपदकमल श्रीगुरून वैष्णवांश्च श्रीरूप साग्रजात सह गणरघुनाथान्वित तम सजीव साइत सवधूत पिजन सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य श्रीराधा कृष्ण पादा सह गणलिता श्री विशाखान्विता नम ओं विष्णुपादाय कृष्ण प्रेष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वते देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातिणे वाछाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पति पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैत गाधर श्रीवास आदिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण so i'm very happy to be with all the devotees of the lester temple shri shri radha madhava and their devotees it's been a while since i have been in touch with all of you uh i do hope all of you are keeping well in the midst of this pandemic and i also hope that all of you ha- have been able to utilize this time nicely for progressing in krishna consciousness 
a very warm welcome also to devotees from other places who have joined in on this talk, both on Zoom as well as on Facebook. And I do hope all of you are also well in all respects. <clears throat> so Pradyumna Prabhu has informed me that uh, every Sunday in Leicester you've been having a series of classes on the various prayers from the Srimad Bhagavatam. And most of the major prayers have been covered by various devotees uh, in the weeks gone by. Uh, when Pradyumna Prabhu asked me to select some prayers, I was thinking uh, which one I should. Then I struck upon the prayers of King Satyavrat for the simple reason that these are prayers that we don't often discuss or hear about. And they're also very short. He actually has these two sets of prayers, the first prayer of five verses and the second prayer of about eight verses. And both are very beautiful, very instructive. But since King Satyavrat is not as famous a personality as Prahlad Maharaj or Dhruva Maharaj or like the gopis, so some introduction or a background may be in order. And this background may be a little substantial, it's just so that we can actually relish uh, the prayers when we actually come to it in some time. So these prayers and this whole episode actually appears <coughs> in the 8th <coughs> canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 24, which is titled Matsya, <coughs> the Lord's Fish Incarnation. And the fish incarnation appears before King Satyavrat. Uh, Satyavrat means one who has taken a vow of truthfulness. There are many Satyavrats in history, but King Satyavrat, who had the fortune of uh, seeing the Matsya avatar in front of him and being instructed by him, is the most prominent one amongst them. <coughs> he was actually a great pious and devoted king who uh, ruled in what is called Dravida Desh or the South Indian uh, part uh, of the world, the Southern Indian part. And uh, he ruled wisely. And at the end of his rule, or towards the end of it, actually the Lord appeared before him. <coughs> and told him to uh, told him about an impending devastation that would take place uh, a week from from that day and he told him to prepare for it king satyavrat uh, appeared in the manmantara called the chakshusha manmantara for those who are not familiar with these terms i'll just explain as you know uh, the creator of the universe is Brahma. Brahma is, of course, the secondary creator. The primary creator is the Supreme Lord himself. And the Lord empowers Brahma to perform the task of creation effectively. He empowers him from within and from without. So, Brahma lives for a long time. The duration of his life is equal to the duration of of the universe itself, which uh, by calculations from the Vedic scriptures comes out approximately to 311 trillion earth years. Now that is a rather long lifespan uh, for, for anyone to have. So Brahma has 100 years, which take up 311 trillion of our years, and each year of his has 360 days and each day of his is uh, divided into, by the way, there are 12 hours of the day and 12 hours of the night. So 12 hours of Brahma's 24 hours, that is the day, <clears throat> uh, is divided into 14 sections or 14 parts, 
each of which are approximately equal and they are called manvantaras for the simple reason that these the duration of these 14 uh, periods represent the life spans or the duration of the reign of individuals called manu <coughs> so these manus are basically the progenitors of the human race uh, in that particular duration of time and it is from the word manu comes the english word man so ultimately of course all these languages have come from sanskrit <coughs> so there are 14 manus in a day of brahma so you can imagine that the lifetime of manu is very very large also although it's very small in comparison to brahma's life but compared to our life it is very small uh, it is very large i beg your pardon and the duration of the manvantara which is the interval between two manus uh, when manu reigns <coughs> is also equal to the duration of the lifetimes of the chief demigods which means the demigods which are positions in the universal administration change in every manvantara so in the first manvantara or the reign of the first manu you have certain individuals who occupy the posts of these demigods like indra chandra varuna etc <coughs> i beg your pardon <coughs> so they look after uh the different aspects of the universe uh and then they change in the next manvantara so currently we are in the period of the seventh manu of the 14 in this particular day of brahma <coughs> this is the 50 the first day of the 51st year of brahma's life and in this first day of the 51st year of brahma's life we are approximately halfway through his day <clears throat> so we are in the 7th manvantara out of the 14 and this manvantara is called the vaivasvata manvantara because in this duration the manu is uh, the son of the sun god vivaswan so from vivaswan comes vaivasvata <coughs> so this manu is called shraddha deva so these are posts just like the word president or prime minister is a post and different individuals having unique names occupy these posts at different times so the person who is now the manu the vaivasvata manu the seventh manu is called shraddha deva <clears throat> so why am i telling you all this because it is uh, king satyavrat who lived in the earlier manvantara the sixth manvantara which was called the chakshusha manvantara uh, where the manu was a person called chakshu <clears throat> and uh, i beg your pardon so at some time in the end of the 6th manu's reign there was a king called satyavrat and it is this satyavrat who later on in the next manvantara the period of the 7th manu became the manu so vaivasvata manu or shraddha dev is none other than uh, satyavrat satyavrat in his previous in his life next life became uh, manu <clears throat> and this manu has been of course mentioned the seventh manu has been mentioned in the bhagavad gita imam vivasvate yogam proktavan aham avyayan vivasvan manave praha manur ikshva kave bravit <clears throat> where krishna says that you know arjuna you are not the first person to whom i am instructing the bhagavad gita long long ago i spoke this message to the sun god vivaswan and then vivaswan spoke it to his son manu this manu is the vaivasvata manu <clears throat> about whom we have just been discussing 
And this Vaivasvat Manu had many sons, the most prominent amongst them being Ikshvaku. And then the solar dynasty began and Lord Ramachandra appeared in that dynasty. <coughs> so, this is the connection between Satyavrat in the sixth Manmantara, the Chakshusha Manmantara, and Vaivasvata Manu, who is the Manu of the seventh Manmantara. <coughs> so, therefore, uh, King Satyavrat is definitely a very prominent personality. But what he is best known for is that uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead appeared just for his sake and for the sake of certain other sages. And he appeared in the form of the Matsya Avatar. The word Matsya indicates a fish. <coughs> so a fish is one of the species or there are different types of fish on earth who live in the water and there are uh, we consider them generally lowly creatures compared to human beings but when the supreme lord appears he can appear within any species of life and we should never consider him to be one of them we should know that even though he appears within these species even though he appears looks like one of them and maybe acts like one of them too but he always remains the transcendentally situated supreme personality of Godhead <coughs> in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam Queen Kunti prays Jarma Karma Cha Vishwatman Ajasya Karto Ratmanaha Tiryak Nrishishu Tad Atyanta Vidambanam she prays to Krishna and says, My dear Krishna, it is indeed bewildering, Vidambanam, that you who are unborn take birth, you who are not obliged to perform any activity, perform so many activities, and what's more, you appear in the species of animals, amongst humans, amongst the sages, and even amongst the aquatics, Yadahasu. And this is truly bewildering. So, therefore, whenever the Lord appears, He may appear in any species, but He always remains the Supreme Lord. So, the Matsya Avatar is a gigantic fish who became gigantic eventually. Uh, in the uh, very famous Gita Govinda, of Jaydev Goswami, one of the songs is um, the Shavatara Stotra, the hymn of the ten incarnations of, of Krishna. And the very first verse there is Pralaya Payodhi Jale Dhritavana Sivedam Vihita Vahitram Charitra Makhedam Keshava Dhrita Meena Sharira Jaya Jagadisha Hare. <coughs> He says, I, I offer my obeisances to Lord Hari, who has appeared now in the form of a fish, to rescue the Vedas who had, which had got immersed in the waters of devastation. So this particular description narrates to an event that happened in the duration of the first Manu, who was called Swayam Bhuva Manu, in this day of Brahma. <coughs> What happened was that um, Brahma, you know, uh, of course, somehow or the other, he, uh, ha you know, he, you know, dozed off for a while by the Lord's arrangement. Although it wasn't his night, Brahma is not known to one who takes naps in the afternoon. Uh, but somehow or the other, by the Lord's arrangement, he happened to doze off a little bit <coughs> and at that time uh, the Vedas were stolen and uh, they happened to be uh, rescued then by uh, the Lord who appeared as the Matsya incarnation or the fish incarnation. So that is the first time that the uh, Lord appeared as the fish incarnation in this day of Brahma. Another appearance that is described in this 
Bhagavatam, and indeed in some other places in the Bhagavatam also, is the event that uh, occurred in connection with King Satyavrat. That happened, as I mentioned, in the duration of the sixth Manmantara of Chakshusha Manu. <coughs> so the episode is quite interesting. Uh, king Satyavrat was a very austere, pious and devoted king, as I mentioned. And one time he was in the banks of the holy river called the Kritamala. And he was standing uh, on the riverbed, on the banks, within the water. <coughs> and he was offering oblations of water into the river with his palms. You know, that's how generally one worships the river itself. So, as he did that, as he cupped his palms uh, to pick up some water to offer to the river, there appeared in his palms a very small fish. And the fish spoke and said, My dear king, uh, please do not release me back into the water because the king was about to release the fish back in the water. He said, Please do not release me into the water because there are large aquatics there and they will swallow me and eat me up. So feeling compassion upon the fish, King Satyavrat then uh, took the fish back home to his palace and he placed him in a water jug. Within a short while, the small fish expanded his body and he said, My dear king, uh, I'm too big, I can't fit into this water jug. So please place me in a, a larger uh, body of water. So the king then placed him in uh, a big well. But soon enough, um, the fish became too big for that well as well. And this was happening um, you know, at rapid intervals. And the fish again pleaded with the king to be placed in, in an even larger body of water. Then he took him and placed him in another larger body of water like a river or something and the fish became too big for that. Eventually, um, the king took him and placed him in the vast ocean. And even then, um, the fish turned to King Satyavrat and said, My dear king, uh, I fear that other fish in this ocean will swallow me and eat me up. So please protect me. And King Satyavrat understood that this has to be the Supreme Lord. Here is a fish who was so tiny that he could fit into the palm of the king's hand. And within the matter of a day, he had grown so large as to, uh, be, uh, as to require the huge ocean to accommodate it. So, in that way, uh, King Satyavrat understood that this was not at all an ordinary fish. <clears throat> and then he started offering prayers. And I'll come to the prayers now. But just a brief mention. Uh, so these are the two times it is said in the Bhagavatam that the Matsya Avatar appeared. Generally, the incarnations of the Lord appear once in a day of Brahma. But the Varaha Avatar, the Bodh Incarnation, appears twice. And in the Srimad Bhagavatam also, we can understand it appears twice as well. So the appearance in front before King Satyavrat was the second appearance. Now, in the book called the Laghu Bhagavatamrita of Srila Rupa Goswami, he cites a verse from the scripture called the Vishnu Dharmottara Puran, in which it is said that actually the Matsya Avatar, the fish incarnation of the Lord, appears in every single Manmantara during the reign of every Manu. So that means the fish incarnation appears in, uh, he appears 14 times in a day of Brahma. <coughs> So that's quite interesting. So now, uh, King Satyavrat, of course, is very astonished 
And so I'll read out the prayers. We'll, we'll talk about the prayers. His first set of prayers, which is about uh, five verses. Um, he starts off, so those of you who have the uh, book in front of you, either the hard copy or the soft copy, you could open up chapter 24 of the eighth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And he says, Ko bhavan asman matsya rupena mohayan. Ko bhavan, who are you? Who are you, my dear sir? Bhavan is a term of, is a respectful address. So when you address somebody who is respectable, there are certain words you use, you know. In English, it's just a you. Whether it's someone who is a child or someone who is worthy of much respect, you know, the form of address is you. But uh, in Sanskrit, there are uh, different words of address that require you to consider who the person in front of you is. If the person in front of you is a very respectable personality, then one uses the word Bhavan. So, anyway, he said, Ko Bhavan, my dear sir, who are you? Asman Matsya Rupena Mohayan, who have taken the form of a fish. And this is very bewildering. And incidentally, in the very beginning of this chapter, uh, it is King Parikshit who asks um, for a description of this fish, uh, of, for the fish incarnation of the Lord. And he asks Shukadev Goswami, he says, Avatara Katham Adhyam Maya Matsya Vidambanam. Please narrate to me the pastime of the Lord when he appeared just like a fish. Maya Matsya Vidambanam. The word Vidambanam indicates a bewilderment, as we heard in Queen Kunti's uh, prayer. And Maya means kind of an imitation thing. It's something false. So Maya Matsya Vedambanam indicates that Parikshit very well understands that even though the Lord appeared as a fish, he wasn't just a fish. He was actually the Supreme Personality of Godhead who just appeared like another fish. So King Parikshit was very eager to know uh, about how and why uh, and in what circumstances uh, the fish incarnation appeared. So that is how the story of King Satyavrat begins. So, having said this now, uh, Satyavrat begins his first uh, prayer. In the first verse, he says, My dear Lord, in one day you have expanded yourself for hundreds of miles, covering the water of the river and the ocean. Before this, I had never seen or heard of such an aquatic animal. So he starts off by saying, My Lord, Bhavan, your Lordship. And he, he concludes this because uh, he has never seen any other creature in this creation expanding like this. Even those who have yogic powers, um, Yes, I'm referring to verse 26 for someone who has a uh, question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, 26. So, um, it says, My dear Lord, you have to be the Lord because uh, you have expanded yourself like this. Uh, That's quite extraordinary. King Satyavrat, of course, must have been quite familiar with the way the yogis can expand themselves or contract themselves, make them heavier, uh, heavier than the heaviest, lighter than the lightest and all of that. But still he understood that this was not just some yogi playing some tricks. You know, it was not some ordinary thing. The kind of expansion that this fish did in just a matter of a few hours indicated to King Satyavrat that this was none other than the Supreme Lord. You see, for one who has eyes to see, the Lord can be very easily recognized directly and indirectly. Indirectly because you see Him in the creation. 
For one who doesn't have the eyes to see, even if they see the Lord directly face to face, they will not accept that person as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You know, for example, Duryodhan. You know, one time, uh, Dhritarashtra, having been advised by uh, Sanjaya and the others about the divine position, the transcendental supremacy of Krishna, uh, Dhritarashtra became overwhelmed and he approached Duryodhana, his son, his evil son, and told him, My dear Duryodhan, you know, please give up your ambitions. You know, uh, just, just give the fair share of the kingdom to your cousins, the Pandavas. And because they are being favored by Krishna. And Krishna is not an ordinary person. He is directly the Supreme Lord. He is the cause of the entire creation. Millions of universes have emanated from him. And Duryodhana was so adamant and so arrogant that he said, even if Krishna were to destroy all the, the universes, you know, I will not surrender to him. Even when Krishna displayed a variation of the universal form at another time in the uh, assembly of King Dhritarashtra, uh, Duryodhan just thought it was some trick, some yogic trick. He could not get himself to believe or accept that Krishna was the Supreme Lord. So others in the place of King Satyavarat would have been bewildered all right by seeing this fish growing, but not, it's not necessary that everybody would have concluded uh, the same thing that King Satyavara did. Because ultimately, to come to some conclusions of this sort, it needs a certain degree of devotional piety. It's not a question of mere material intelligence. So Satyavara rightly concludes that this is the Supreme Lord. <clears throat> and then he says, Nunam tvam bhagavan sakshad harir narayano avyavaha vyayaha vyayaha avyayaha that means uh, imperishable so you are certainly nunam tvam bhagavan sakshad you are directly the supreme lord hari and narayana who is inexhaustible who is imperishable this is how he has now started praying to this fish. Anugrahaya Bhutanam. Anugraha means mercy. Bhutanam refers to the living entities. So, Dhatse Rupam Jalaukasam. So, you have assumed this form of a fish, uh, Rupam, this particular form, Jalaukasam, to live in the water as an aquatic only for the purpose of bestowing your mercy upon the living entities of this world. So the devotees of the Lord understand that the Lord is the ever-well-wisher of all living entities and He only desires the well-being of everybody. And it is only for this end that He appears within this material world although he is fully satisfied in his own divine abode in the spiritual world. He doesn't have a need to descend here, but it is only out of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls here that he descends. Anugrahaya Bhutanam. And then in the next verse, he again offers his obeisances and respects to the Lord and says, Namaste Purusha Shreshtha. He says, Namaste. All of you have heard the phrase, Namaste. Namaste is generally done with folded hands. And the meaning of this verse, Namaste, means Namaha Te. Namaha refers to obeisances and Te means unto you. So such is the dignified nature of the Vedic culture that whenever you meet anyone, you say, Namaste which means you're actually offering or saying that you're offering obeisances to that person. So it's not a, just a question of saying howdy or hi, you know, all these casual types of acquaintances, but you say namaste. Of course, as devotees, we fold our hands and say Hare Krishna, 
we glorify Krishna and Srimati Radharani by saying this. So he says, Namaste Purusha Shreshta. Purusha means the personality. Shreshta means the topmost or the best. So you, I offer my obeisances to you who are the topmost personality. And you are the Lord, Ishwaraha, Lord of what? Sthiti, Utpati and also Apyaya. Sthiti means the maintenance, Utpati means creation, Apyaya means the destruction. So I offer my obeisances to you, the best of all persons, who is the Lord of the creation, the maintenance and the destruction of the whole universe. And you are also Mukhyaha, you are the chief. And Atma Gatihi, you are the ultimate destination for whom? Bhakta Naam Nah Prapanna Naam. Bhakta Naam refers to devotees. And Prapanna Naam refers to surrender, those who are surrendered. So, my dear Lord, I offer my obeisances to you, who are the topmost of all personalities, who, are the, who is the Lord of the creation, maintenance and destruction of this cosmos, and who is the chief and the ultimate destination for us surrendered devotees. So, such a nice prayer. So, say, the Lord is the destination for all surrendered devotees. Bhakta Nam Prapanna Nam. And then in the next verse, he speaks about the purposes of the Lord's incarnations. Sarve Leela Vatara Aste Bhuta Nam Bhuti Hetavaha. Sarve means all. Leela means pastime. Avataraha refers to the incarnations in plural. Avataraha. He says, so all your incarnations. All your pastimes, Bhutanam, Bhuti, Bhuti refers here to the well being, Bhutanam to the living entities. So, Hetavaha. So, the cause of your appearance in various incarnations, the cause of your performing pastimes in these various incarnations is simply Bhutanam, Bhuti, for effecting the well being of all living entities. Gyatum Ichami. Ichami means I want to know. Gyatum Ichami. I desire to know. Ado Rupam. This form that you have taken today. Yad Artham Bhavata Dhritam. Bhavata means yourself, your good self. Dhritam have assumed. Yad Artham for what purpose? So King Satyavrat knows that the general purpose for the Lord's advent is the well-being of all living entities. But he also understands that the Lord also descends for some specific purposes. For example, um, in the first incarnation as Matsya, he came to rescue the Vedas. When Varahadev came the first time, he came to rescue the earth which was submerged in the Garbhodaka ocean. So when Lord Narsimhadev appeared, he, he appeared to rescue his dear devotee Prahlad. So in this way, the incarnations of the Lord have a general purpose, <clears throat> which is to effect the well-being of all living entities. But these incarnations also have some specific purposes that they wish to fulfill. So Satyavrat Maharaj is keen to know what that specific purpose is and in what way exactly the Lord intends to do good to the living entities. And then in the last verse of this prayer, he says, he distinguishes the worship of the demigods from the worship of the Supreme Lord. And I'm reading the Srila Prabhupada's translation here. O oh my Lord, possessing eyes like the lotus, the, like the petals of a lotus, the worship of the demigods who are in the bodily concept of life is fruitless in all respects. But because you are the supreme friend and dear most super, super soul of everyone, worship of your lotus feet is never useless. 
you have therefore manifested your form as a fish so here is a clear distinction between these two types of worship worship of the supreme lord on one hand and the worship of anything else all the way up to the demigods on the other hand the worship of the lord is fully fruitful it is truly beneficial eternally so because the lord is our supreme friend to everybody and he is also the dear most super soul of all so these are the two reasons king satyavrat gives in this verse for uh justifying uh our need to worship and surrender to the supreme personality of godhead because it is uh due to these two qualities that the lord can actually do real good to us he is our real well-wisher and he is seated in our heart as our dear most friend as the super soul he is not only omniscient he is not only omnipresent he is also omnipotent so not only is he our well-wisher but he is fully capable of effecting our good other personalities on the other hand the demigods included are lacking in both aspects in in terms of being the well wishers of the living entities in all respects and also in terms of their strength and their ability to actually do good permanently to uh, the people of this world in his purport shri prabhupad emphasizes that as the human beings on this planet have to change their bodies tatha dehantara praptihi the living entities known as indra chandra varuna and so on will also have to change their bodies in course of time so in the bhagavad gita also krishna says antavattu phalam tesham tad bhavat yalpa medasam devan deva yajo yanti mad bhakta yanti mam api krishna says antavattu phalam tesham tad bhavati alpa medasam he said those who worship the demigods have less intelligence alpa medasam because the benedictions that they may receive from the demigods are temporary in nature antavattu phalam so therefore the demigods are temporary their benedictions are temporary their abodes are temporary devan deva yajo yanti so the deva yaja had those who, who are worshipers of the devas the demigods devan they go to the demigods the, their planets but those planets are temporary the demigods are temporary the benedictions are temporary <clears throat> therefore it is fruitless to worship the demigods <clears throat> <clears throat> on the other hand mad bhakta yanti mam api my devotees krishna says will attain to me in my eternal abode in the spiritual world so devotees of krishna will eventually attain to um the spiritual world and eternal life so now after king satyavrat has prayed like this um the uh, the fish incarnation matsya avatar tells him my dear king i will uh, something very special is going to happen in 7 days from now there will be a huge devastation uh, a pralaya a flood and the entire earth planet will be submerged in water at that time i will arrange for a boat to come to you and you should enter into that boat along with the seven sages and carry along with you various types of herbs and seeds and plants and so on and then using the uh, snake vasuki as a rope you tie this boat to the horn that is at the tip of my body and i will wander throughout the waters of destruction 
And when the uh, waters of devastation recede or start receding, I will tie you to the top of the Himalaya mountains. I will anchor the boat to the top of the Himalaya mountains and then you can resume your respective duties once again. So King Satyavrat uh, accepted this instruction, went back and began to wait for that seven day period to, to uh, com get completed. And then finally, as the Lord had said, there was huge deluge of water and it continued for days and days and the water level started rising very rapidly and King Satyavrat was ready and so were the seven sages and King Satyavrat has, had also collected the required herbs and seeds and so on and then uh, the boat came along in another scripture, I think it's the Matsya Puran, it has been mentioned that the earth was none other than a form of Mother Earth, the boat. So the seven sages and the king uh, boarded this boat, taking along the seeds and herbs and creepers and also some other living entities. And they and the fish wandered throughout the waters of devastation uh, throughout the night of Brahma. So this must, uh, actually it wasn't the night of Brahma again because it is the end of the Chakshu Manmantara which is halfway through the day of Brahma so it can't be the night. So Srila Prabhupada mentions in the purport that this means that uh, Brahma, you know, dozed off, you know. But Brahma's dozing is not like our dozing when we are in the Bhagavatam class or in Japa, we may doze off, uh, but that's covered by the mode of ignorance. But Brahma is such a special personality. Uh, whenever he goes into moments of forgetfulness, we can understand that these are special arrangements of the Supreme Lord. Because the Lord has some very special purposes to fulfill. So in any case, that was Vishwanath Chakravarti's Thakur, which Srila Prabhupada cites in the purport. So anyway, so somehow the other, there was this devastation. And um, so it went on and on, and the end of the Chakshusha Manmantara. And then when the water subsided, then uh, the sages, and, and they all descended and resumed their responsibilities. So the Lord here favored King Satyavrat by appearing before him. Actually, uh, after that, it is the Lord who personally instructed King Satyavrat and the seven sages in the science of the absolute truth. That is also mentioned in this chapter. So King Satyavrat became very well versed with uh, the teachings of the Lord. So, at the end of the sixth uh, Manmantara, then uh, there was a period uh, where there was devastation and then uh, the seventh Manmantara began where King Satyavrat was reborn as uh, Vaivasvata Manu, and the son of the sun god. Now, coming to the second prayers, as... After the um, yes, so we'll now come to the towards the end of the that chapter. So when the fish incarnation appeared, as the Lord had promised, then he began Satyavrat Muni began to offer prayers to the Lord. So this is the second prayer that he offers, and there are eight verses in this. In the first verse, he speaks about the uh, situation of the conditioned living entities and the possibility of them encountering some good fortune in the shape of meeting some devotees of the Lord. Generally, the situation of the condition, conditioned living entities is miserable. By the grace of the Lord, 
those who have lost their self-knowledge since time immemorial and who because of this ignorance are involved in a material conditional life full of miseries obtain the chance to meet the Lord's devotee. So the greatest fortune one can have in life is that one can meet a pure devotee of the Lord. This is Yes, sorry, there was some issue with my internet. I hope it wasn't interrupted. Okay. okay now, yeah. Uh, so the, the greatest fortune um, of the living entity is to come in touch with a pure devotee of the Lord. And he concludes this verse by saying, I accept that Supreme Personality of Godhead as a Supreme Spiritual Master. Now this is a theme that uh, he will repeat again in the verses to come of the Lord being the Supreme Spiritual Master. Krishna is the um, Adi Guru, the original Guru, the original Spiritual Master of everyone. In the second verse, he distinguishes between false happiness and true happiness. And he says, in hopes of becoming happy in this material world, the foolish conditioned soul performs fruitive activities that result only in suffering. So this is the description of false happiness. And then he speaks about true happiness. But by rendering service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one becomes free from such false desires for happiness. May my Supreme Spiritual Master cut the knot of false desires from the core of my heart. So, yat sevayatam. So this seva or this service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead is what uh, is, is considered by King Satyavarat rightly to be true happiness. In the third verse, um, King Satyavrata is speaking about the process of purification of the living entity from his or her material entanglement in this world. And that purification comes about by service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he compares this process to the process of uh, gold or silver uh, when it's in the ore, in the shape of the mineral or the ore, and the pure gold or silver is not accessible to us, then it has to go through a process of uh, uh, being placed in very high temperature uh, in the fire. And then the other substances, they are separated from the gold and the pure gold emerges. So in the same way, the living entity has to go through a process of purification in the material world. Um, and what is that? He speaks about it. One who wants to be free of material entanglement should take up the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and give up the contamination of ignorance involving pious and impious activities. So you can see the repeating theme of taking up service to the Supreme Lord as the only essence and of the Lord being the Supreme Spiritual Master. Thus one regains his original identity just as a block of gold or silver sheds all dirt and becomes purified when treated with fire. May that inexhaustible Supreme Personality of Godhead become our Spiritual Master for he is the original spiritual master of all other spiritual masters. So there are many kinds of gurus. There is the uh, Diksha Guru, there is Shiksha Guru, there is Vartma Pradarshaka Guru, one who shows us the path. There is Chaitya Guru, that is the Lord in the heart. So Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the origin of all of them. And he is the original guru. And in the fourth verse, uh, King Satyavrat distinguishes the mercy of the Lord from the mercy, quote-unquote, mercy 
of others. He says, neither all the demigods, nor the so-called gurus, nor all other people, either independently or together, can offer mercy that equals even one ten thousandth of yours. Therefore, I wish to take shelter of your lotus feet. So, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada says, people generally do not become devotees of Lord Vishnu since Lord Vishnu never becomes the order supplier of his devotees. So, in materialistic life, one's conception of mercy is that one should be given all sorts of material facilities and enjoyments. Whereas when one comes to spiritual life, one understands that real mercy means to get service to the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in a pure-hearted way. So those who worship the demigods, are uh, they do so because they have material desires to fulfill. But there is no comparison. Actually, Mercy of anyone other than Krishna is a misnomer. It can't happen because Krishna is the original reservoir of mercy. Whatever mercy anyone else is able to bestow <clears throat> is not only very quantitatively insignificant compared to Krishna's, like a drop compared to an ocean, but also one must know that the mercy that anybody else will bestow, whether it is um, the demigod or anybody else eventually is coming from Krishna. And then in the fifth verse, he speaks on a familiar theme that appears many times in the Vedic teachings and also in the Bhagavatam, that is of the blind leading the blind. Achakshur andhasya yatha agraniha kritaha Achakshu means even though one does not have the power of sight, andhasya, for such a blind person, yatha as agranihi means the leader. So the blind leading the blind. Prahlad Maharaj also speaks about that. Yes. As a blind man being unable to see accepts another blind man as his leader, people who do not know the goal of life accept someone as a guru who is a rascal and a fool. But we are interested in self-realization. Therefore, we accept you, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as our spiritual master. For you are able to see in all directions and are omniscient like the sun. In the Bhagavad Mahatmya, it has been mentioned that there are compatible, uh, uh, you know, pairs and incompa incompatible pairs of uh, speaker and listener of the scriptures. You know, when there is um, a materialistic speaker and spiritually minded listeners, it's incompatible. Or when there is a spiritually minded speaker and materialistically minded listeners, that's also incompatible. Both are unhappy. And the compatible speakers are when there is a materialistic speaker and materialistic listeners. It's compatible, but it is not conducive to ultimate well-being. So that is just spoken of, you know, in a tongue of, you know, tongue-in-cheek manner. But the real compatibility is when the uh, guru and the disciple, the speaker and the listener, the teacher and the student. Both are seriously spiritually inclined and seek only the perfection of self-realization. But there are those who do not teach and practice genuine self-realization. They may teach so many other things which are materialism masquerading as spiritualism. So uh, King Satyavrat is very wise and he understands that we should not be misled by such spiritually blind people. And in verse 6, he continues this theme of materialistic gurus, of people who are spiritually blind, who do not understand what real spiritual life is, but 
than they claim that they do. Quote, a materialistic so-called guru instructs his materialistic disciples about economic development and sense gratification and because of such instructions, the foolish disciples continue in the materialistic existence of ignorance. But your lordship gives knowledge that is eternal and the intelligent person receiving such knowledge is quickly situated in his original constitutional position. So again, a distinction between the materialistic guru and the real guru. So by following the materialistic guru, one simply uh, succeeds in perpetuating one's duration of existence in the material world. Whereas by taking instructions from the Supreme Lord, who is the original Guru, or his representatives coming in the disciplic succession, one actually gets reinstated in one's original constitutional position. In text 7, or the 7th verse of the prayer, he distinguishes, or rather he speaks about the Lord as a supreme well-wisher and bemoans the fact that there are others, many conditioned living entities who are unable to perceive this. My Lord, you are the supreme well-wishing friend of everyone, the dear most friend, the controller, the super soul, the supreme instructor and the giver of supreme knowledge and fulfillment of all desires. But although you are within the heart, the foolish because of lusty desires in the heart cannot understand you. So one of the very important uh, points in understanding the Supreme Absolute Truth is to see that He is our eternal well-wisher. Suhurudam sarva bhutanam jnatva mam shantim richati. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that to understand that Krishna is our true and eternal well-wisher is the formula for peace. One cannot have peace internally or externally, individually or collectively, unless one accepts this fundamental principle of Krishna being the eternal well-wisher of all living entities. Human beings and living entities in general are wont to uh, making discrimination and to uh, make distinctions and have some people as favorites, some people as friends, other people as enemies, and so on. But Krishna, and of course then his pure devotees, they do not make such distinctions. They ever remain our well-wishers. But the unfortunate thing is, Satyavrat says, there are some people who do not understand this. And the reason that they are not able to understand this is because their hearts are full of materialistic desires. And finally, in the last verse of this prayer, he concludes by speaking about surrender. O Supreme Lord, for self-realization I surrender unto you, who are worshipped by the demigods as a supreme controller of everything. By your instructions, exposing life's purpose, Kindly cut the knot from the core of my heart and let me know the destination of my life. Ultimately, everything must, knowledge must culminate in surrender. Prapadya Isham. Isham means the Lord. Prapadya means to surrender. Bahunam janmanam ante jnanaman maam prapadyate vasudevaha sarvam viti samahatma sudurlabhaha. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, that after many, many lifetimes of culminate, of, of gathering knowledge, one who truly understands knowledge surrenders unto me, understanding me to be the Lord of everything. That is Krishna's repeated uh, message in, um, in the Bhagavad Gita. We have to surrender, we have to surrender, which means to follow Krishna's instructions. So, this concludes the prayers of King uh, Satyavrat. And Shukadev Goswami uh, then explains 
how the Supreme Personality of Godhead spoke uh, transcendental knowledge. Uh, and then uh, King Satyavrat being so illumined in his next birth he became uh, Vaivasvata Manu. And there is, as is usual in the Bhagavatam, uh, something called the Palashruti, which means the fruits of hearing, the benefits of hearing something, a particular pastime. So here it says, This story concerning the great king Satyavrat, the fish incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu, is a great transcendental narration. Anyone who hears it is delivered from the reactions of sinful life. And anyone who narrates this description will certainly have all ambitions fulfilled and will undoubtedly return home back to Godhead. So now please go and narrate what you have heard today in this class in the pastime of King Satyavrat and the Matsya incarnation of the Lord to somebody and then you can be assured of going home back to Godhead. So I want to conclude with just a, a, a few words about, because somebody asked that question here, uh, about a parallel between the Matsya incarnation pastime and um, Noah's Ark. I think that was the question here somewhere. Um, yeah. Are there parallels between Satyavrat and Noah's? Both have floods, boats and saving animals. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know, there is a remarkable, remarkable parallel. Uh, the Lord appears before these individuals. He tells them there's going to be a flood that will come in a certain number of days. He gives them instructions which are very similar. Um, he also yeah, tells them about the herbs and the creepers and animals and you, you come into this boat and then I will uh, swim around and you will swim around and you will move on the boat in the water of devastation and eventually then uh, you will be anchored to uh, the peak of some of the high mountains and from there you can resume uh, your life again. So remarkable similarities. Uh, and also in uh, another Sumerian or Babylonian episode, I forget the name now, uh, Gigalmesh or something like that, Gigalmesh, uh, the Lord didn't appear to him but he was considered a hero in the Mesopotamian uh, or the Sumerian civilization. And he came across this person who had been, uh, you know, uh, who had gone through exactly what Noah went through. It was a separate narration. And similar types of instructions that a flood would come and he would have to make a boat and takes the seeds and creepers and plants and living and the animals and board that boat and he would be protected all through the journey and the waters of devastation and then he would be anchored to the peak of hills of some mountain and then life could resume. So we can see that these three uh, narrations have very remarkable similarities and it definitely can't be chance. It's too much to be chance. So it indicates that these Vedic narrations, uh, they have been extant or are existing uh, on this planet for millennia and millennia. And at some point, uh, according to local cultures and languages and circumstances, they are presented in slightly different ways with different names. Some details may change. Um, but, but we can see that by far, uh, the greatest detail is given here in books like the Srimad Bhagavatam and then also in the Matsya Purana and other scriptures. So, okay, so I think we'll stop here. So, Pradyumna Prabhu, uh, I'm, I'm open for questions if it's not too late. And what is the program? Sure, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful narration. Um, there were a couple of questions in addition to the question on Noah. Yes. I see that question 
as to why um, we do we celebrate the appearance days of other incarnations, but there doesn't appear to be a celebration for Matsya. Yes, yes. Because you see, there are, there are so many other incarnations of the Lord. The Lord has innumerable incarnations. Uh, we don't even celebrate the appearance day of, of uh, all the Dashavataras, right? Um, there is Kalki, there is Buddha, you know, so we don't celebrate. So our Acharyas have selected some of the more prominent ones. And we celebrate them. So we have essentially uh, Krishna, Gauranga Mahaprabhu, and then Sri Ramachandra, Narsimhadev, Varahadev. These are some uh, of the incarnations or the forms of the Lord that we, whose appearance days we celebrate. But there are others, like you've mentioned, even Parshuram Jayanti, we don't really celebrate so much. Um, so it's just the way the Acharyas have selected the more prominent um, avatars for us to celebrate. Although these are also important and we should study them and read them and, and remember them. Okay? Thank you, Maharaj. Um, it was interesting in the prayers to hear the theme of the spiritual master coming through in the verses that Satyavrat Maharaj was speaking. Is there any particular reason why those prayers had that focus on the spiritual master? Yes, and not just spiritual master. He focuses on the Lord as the spiritual master. You will see this is the theme that's you know throughout the second prayer. Because he wants to emphasize, I presume, that anyone who claims to be a spiritual master must represent the Lord, who is the original spiritual master, without having connection uh, to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One cannot act in the position of a guru. And that connection happens uh, through the medium of the disciplic succession. Uh, you can see that in, in as much as he speaks about the Lord as the Supreme Guru, he also mentions occasionally about the false materialistic gurus. So any guru, so-called guru, who doesn't speak about God, who doesn't speak about devotion to God and the perfection of self-realization is not to be considered a genuine guru. And even if someone claims to be a guru but is teaching about God, teaching about devotion to God, but uh, claims that he is directly connected to God and he doesn't have any disciplic succession, one should reject such a personality as well. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. That's very insightful. Um, there's a question here. Who were the seven sages? The seven sages, they're called Sapta Rishis. Now, they are sages like Kashyapa and Atri and, you know, like that. All these sages are sons of Brahma who uh, are responsible for various functions. You know, you have the great bear in the sky, the big bear. For those of you who know a few constellations in the sky, also called the Ursa Major. So in Sanskrit, that's called the Saptarishi. You have the seven. So anyway, the seven sages, they are the ones who uh, generally oversee and they assist Manu uh, in performing many of these functions. They are also progenitors, they are also givers of knowledge, they are the ones who establish the processes of sacrifice and so on and so forth. So these are the seven sages and they, they, they also change periodically in, in every Manmantara. So different personalities occupy the, the position of the one of the seven sages. Thank you, Maharaj. 
Um, Sundar Nandapu has a question. In Bhagavad Gita, chapter 10, text 2, Krishna says the demigods and sages can't understand him. So which sages does Krishna refer to? The non-devotee sages. Say like Durvasa Muni was a yogi, but he wasn't a devotee. So it was only after the Ambarish Maharaj episode that he began to understand the glory of devotees and the glory of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So one who can't understand Krishna can't also understand Krishna's devotees and their glories. So essentially Krishna is referring here to the non-devotee sages. Thank you. Um, How do we respond to people who say these are all mythological? Hmm. Well, um, people may say so many things, it's a question of whether, you know, who the person is and what his or her mindset is. If the person is genuinely willing to listen and engage in a discussion, then you know, you can take the matter forward. But if the person simply, uh, you know, wants to argue (laughs) or is uh, very dismissive about anything you say, then perhaps the discussion won't go very far. In which case, perhaps it's best in some cases to just give them some prasadam and maybe just uh, have some kirtan or something like that or so they can... Uh, understand Krishna gradually at some point. But if they are indeed inquisitive really, uh, truly to know, uh, then you can speak about uh, what mythology is. Just because something has happened at a certain point of time in the past and we don't have uh, records of it, Uh, in the way that we, um, shall we say, record things today, it doesn't mean that those things don't exist. You know, there are some, um, I think there was a mathematician called uh, John Craig or somebody, Scotsman. I think he had a theory. He tried to apply the principles of mathematics to history. And uh, he he tried to um, come to some conclusions and some pattern. Now, I I don't know exactly what his whole theory is and I'm not here vouching for the veracity or otherwise of his uh, uh, theory. But from what I remember, it was something reasonable. He said that for the transformation from truth to myth... There are certain criteria, one of which is how long uh, is the time span that has elapsed between the time the event occurred and the time the event is being discussed. The longer the time span, the greater the likelihood that the event would be considered mythology. And also in terms of distance, the greater the distance, you know, that also holds good. So these events that we uh, read in the Bhagavatam and the Vedic scriptures have happened so long ago in the past, millions and millions of years ago in the past, that there's no possibility of any empirical evidence of these things existing. Because of the kind of floods that you've had that have uh, covered the whole earth, where is the possibility of any such uh, modern, you know, ex- um, archaeologically or scientifically acceptable empirical evidence for today. That's not possible. So we have to rely on a transcendental source of evidence which which, uh, is beyond the uh, vagaries of time. You know, the, the hard material evidence, the archaeological evidence, paleontological evidence and such things, they are subject to the vagaries of time, they get destroyed eventually. But the 
transmission of transcendental knowledge in a bona fide disciplic succession and the scriptures which come through this disciplic succession they transcend such vagaries because this knowledge remains despite the upheavals that may and will happen in the material world so they remain untouched but because from the modern standpoint some of these things may appear so fantastic uh, so we think it's mythology but remember that even uh, 200 years ago who could have imagined that today we could have computers that will compute at such speeds and so on you know the kind of things the way technology has progressed today would anybody 500 years ago or or so have even imagined that we could have this kind of uh, transformation in such a short time and we're speaking of only a few centuries so imagine when there are time spans that uh, are millions of years what kind of changes would have happened so how do we expect realistically that uh, we will get empirical evidence here so you can explain in this way and then talk to that person if he if he or she is still willing to listen talk to them about the three type three types of evidence pratyaksha praman which means empirical evidence uh, i mean evidence gathered from our sensory perception anuman praman evidence gathered by inference based on sensory perception and the third being shabda praman which means the evidence of the vedic scriptures in which case um uh, in the third case such knowledge is full proof it is not subject to the frailties uh, of uh, knowledge that is concocted by human beings and it is not subjected to the damage that is inflicted upon uh, evidence uh, that is hard material evidence so this sustains and therefore if you really want to know things which are beyond us in time and space which are beyond our capacity to measure and understand and prove then uh, instead of just whimsically um dismissing such comprehensive bodies of knowledge as mythology uh, it would bode us well to be open minded and try to understand what these scriptures say what this knowledge is all about uh then uh we stand to do ourselves the biggest favor in life we will get access to the highest knowledge that humanity can ever have so this question was asked by nityananda so nityananda i hope this has answered your question okay so why different reaction to brihaspati to indra as opposed to durvasa to ambarish in terms of the sage mentality uh i didn't understand the question krishna i just not um i was just thinking of this extending that sage uh, issue further okay christian the sage in 10.2 um uh, brahaspati when was offended by indra but not not paying the uh, um respect just walked away quietly as opposed to the uh, intense reaction of durvasha to ambrish's so called offense yes i just wanted to get into the mentality of these sages because they are also quite exalted devotees or or, or at least become devotees eventually why is there such a difference of reaction and as us uh, at the fallen souls how do we how do we then take a uh, um, lesson from that okay you see as i mentioned earlier uh, not all sages are devotees not all munis are devotees and because they are not devotees um they will sometimes exhibit such traits of getting angry furious cursing um 
Even Narad Muni, the great devotee, curses, but there's a difference. When Narad Muni curses, it is not out of ego, not out of anger, but out of mercy, out of compassion. And sometimes these sages, uh, even if they're not devotees, they may exhibit compassion, they may exhibit some uh, nice traits. Uh, so how do we understand it? It's just that there are different kinds of transcendentalists who are all at different uh, spaces, and they all react differently, they're different individuals. And in many cases, some of these pastimes, uh, not in all cases, but in many cases, they're orchestrated by the Supreme Lord to teach lessons to the world. Uh, for example, Durvasa Muni Nambarish Maharaj, we can understand the glories of devotees of the Lord vis-a-vis uh, -vis other transcendentalists from the story of, from the pastime of Durvasa and Ambarish Maharaj. Okay, so one last question here. Okay. How do we understand the principle of time when we study these pastimes? Um, I didn't follow. Well, time flows, as I said, um, you know, from the Chakshusha Manmantara, and the sixth, the duration of the sixth Manu, and then it moved on, to, there was a period, and then the seventh Manu's period has begun, and these time scales are so massive as to practically make no sense to us, because, you know, we, our mind cannot conceptualize or, visual, or accommodate such time frames. You know, our mind can accommodate very limited ranges of space and time at both extremes. Um, so therefore, we, for us, it's just a figure. You know, we can speak in terms of trillion years, but what does it really mean to a trillion years? How is 311 trillion years different from 150 trillion years? You know, it's, it's still massive. But from that point of view, it's half, it's 50% of 311 trillion. But from our point of view, the 150 and 300 is trillion years. It's just, it really doesn't make any difference to us. So time acts in this material world in a certain way that causes destruction. It moves unidirectionally from past to present into the future. And we can just see this as an energy of the Lord. Uh, as he says in the Bhagavad Gita, Kalo Smi, that I am time. And seeing that time is an energy of the Lord, we can try to utilize it in the service of the Lord. Okay, so... Thank you so much, Maharaj. Okay. Time is upon us. <laughs> yes. And it is getting very late for you there. Uh, I want to thank you so much on behalf of all the devotees that have gathered here today. Thank you so much for taking us. Uh, it's very rare that we spend quite a lot of time with prayers of King Satyavrata, as you mentioned. And uh, so today was, was really nice to get into prayers that we, 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 we don't learn or we don't hear of often. So thank you so much for taking us into those prayers. And thank you so much for um, uh, giving your time into your evening today. Really, really uh, appreciate that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Pradyumna Prabhu. And thank you to all the devotees. <coughs> Shri Shri Radha Madhava Ki Jai. Yeah. Jai. Shri Shri uh, Radha Gokulananda. Our deity is here, by the way. Okay. Radha Gokulananda Ki Jai. Shri La Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gol okay. Premanande Hari Hari Bo. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you joining today and next week we have His Holiness Bhakti Prabhav Maharaj